Hello and welcome back to CS11747 Neural Networks for NLP. This time I'll be talking about margin-based and reinforcement learning for structured prediction. So as we talked before, there are several types of prediction, such as binary classification, where we make a prediction over two labels, multi-class classification, where we make a prediction over multiple labels, more than two, but not a very large number, and structured prediction, where we make a prediction over a large number of labels, so large that we can't enumerate all of them, like making a prediction of a part of speech sequence or a translation. So structured prediction uh, becomes difficult uh, for a number of reasons. One reason that we talked about before is exposure bias. And exposure bias is basically that in normal maximum likelihood training or teacher forcing that we typically do with models such as encoder-decoder models, we assume that we're feeding in the correct previous input, but at test time we may make mistakes and these mistakes may propagate. Uh, so for example, if we feed in the word I and uh, then get the word I again for whatever reason the model is confused or something like this, this may uh, convince the model that the word I should just be repeated endlessly forever. Uh, because it's never seen a mistaken repeat in the uh, previous uh, training data. And this is called exposure bias because the model is not exposed to mistakes during training and can't deal with them at test time. Another issue is that maximum likelihood training it has disregard for the evaluation metrics that we want in the end. So in the end, we want good outputs from our model and uh, good translations or outputs in general can be measured with metrics such as blue or meteor or F1 score. And some mistaken predictions may hurt more than others, so we'd like to penalize them appropriately. So for example, if we're using a machine translation metric that considers paraphrases, a model might output a paraphrase and not be penalized very much at all, whereas if it outputs a wrong content word, it might be penalized greatly. Maximum likelihood doesn't make any distinction between these because it treats all words and sequences as equal. There are many varieties of structured prediction and we've talked about a bunch of different models and a bunch of different training algorithms. And we've already covered things like uh, RNN-based decoders, uh, convolutional self-attentional decoders and CRF with local factors and maximum likelihood estimation for all of them. Um, we've also covered sequence level likelihood with respect to things like CRFs through dynamic programming algorithms. Um, today, what I would like to talk about is sequence level likelihood for models that cannot do dynamic programming and also a suite of other algorithms that we'll get to in a bit. So as a reminder from the CRF class, uh, there's a difference between locally and globally normalized models, where in locally normalized models, each decision made by the model has a probability that adds to one. So basically we calculate the probability of the output sequence by multiplying together the probabilities of each local decision. So this is convenient because it turns a structured prediction problem into a multi-class uh, sequence of multi-class prediction problems. Uh, but it has issues like exposure, exposure bias, for example. There are also globally normalized models or energy-based models where each sentence has a score which is not normalized over a particular decision. So we calculate the score of the sentence and then normalize over uh, the bottom uh, thing here. The issue, however, is that the um, partition function, the denominator in that uh, equation here is difficult to calculate because Remember, we have an exponential or infinite number of uh, potential outputs, and because of this, uh, we can't just sum over them uh, naively. And in the previous class for CRFs, we used a dynamic programming algorithm to calculate this partition function. Um, but there's, it's also possible to estimate the partition function through subsampling the hypothesis space. And for any model that we use that doesn't allow for a convenient factorization like a CRF or a context-free grammar, um, this subsampling basically becomes necessary and is used widely. So for sampling, um, 
for these kind of subsample based methods, there's further two uh, kind of ways that we can do this. And one way is through sampling. So sampling, uh, which you may know from a machine learning class or other variety of a class um, on kind of statistics or something like this, it essentially samples K samples according to their probability distribution. And then these K samples can be used to approximate any value that we want to calculate. And in particular, in this case, we would like to approximate the uh, partition function here. And the way we approximate it is by sampling according to the model's uh, score, basically. This is uh, useful because it's an unbiased estimator. As k gets very large, um, it will approach the true distribution. So this is why sampling is particularly useful. Um, we just need to sample more and more, and eventually we'll get a good estimate of the quantity that we want to calculate. However, um, it is high variance. So what if we get a bunch of low probability samples, or we have important low probability samples uh, that have a high score or something like this and are not included in this uh, sampling distribution. Another uh, way we could do this is we can do uh, approximate search for the highest probability outputs. So we search for the k-best hypotheses, for example, and uh, use these to calculate the probability, uh, the partition function. So the issue with this is that this is a biased estimator. Um, so because you're only picking high probability samples, this may result in systematic differences from the true, true distribution. Um, however, it might be lower variance because we're more likely to get high probability outputs that will have a large effect on the quantity we want to calculate. So to summarize, um, if we want to do some sort of training and we aren't able to calculate all of the outputs, um, we can sample uh, using our model, like an encoder-decoder model, for example, where we can do beam search and get a subset of the outputs and then use this to calculate whatever loss function we want to calculate. And all of the methods I talk about for the rest of the day will be following this procedure. So let me first talk about unnormalized models. Um, and unnormalized models are essentially models that are not probabilistic models, but nonetheless can be used to train uh, a model that does a good job at getting uh, outputs. So what do I mean by this? Um, when we calculate a best output and, for example, show it to a user in the case of a translation, um, at inference time, we often just want the best hypothesis. So we're just doing this argmax here. So basically, any model that we train uh, we don't really need to, you know, normalize it if all we're doing is taking the argmax. So essentially, we um, we just calculate, uh, just need to have the best scoring value here to uh, be good, to be a good value. So what the structured perceptron algorithm does is it tries to encourage just that. It's an extremely simple way of training non-probabilistic models. And what we do is we find the one best. And if the one best's score is better than the correct answer, we adjust the parameters to fix this. And when I say one best here, I mean the one best according to the model score. So here's the algorithm. It's so simple that I can write it all on one slide and not overwhelm you with a wall of text. So what we do is we search for the highest scoring hypothesis that is not the true hypothesis. And if the score of the highest scoring hypothesis that is not the, tr that is not the true hypothesis is higher than the score of the true hypothesis, then we update the parameters. So we find the one best. If the score is better than the reference, then we increase the score of the reference and decrease the score of the one best. And um, you can see that we're doing a standard uh, SGD update where we um, basically increase the score of the one best or increase the derivatives of the one best and decrease uh, the score according to the derivative of the um, of the negative sample that we get. 
So fortunately, we can also just write this as a loss function. So um, it's essentially this uh, perceptron loss where we calculate the score of the, uh, the thing that the model found and we calculate the score of the, uh, the correct answer. And then we make the loss function equal to the maximum of zero and this value. So if the, high, if the correct answer is scoring better than any other hypothesis, then the loss is zero. Otherwise, uh, the loss is, um, is this value over here. So the resulting gradient uh, actually looks like the perceptron algorithm. Uh, because it uh, looks like this here. So if the loss is higher, um, if the score is higher for the model found value than the correct, uh, the correct output, then we give this derivative. Otherwise, we give a derivative of zero. And because this is a normal loss function, it can be used directly in neural networks if you would uh, so choose. One thing um, to note here is that this is extremely simple, but it requires finding the argmax in addition to the true candidate during training, which means you must do prediction during training. Um, and this is different from teacher forcing, where teacher forcing only considers the score of the highest uh, scoring value um, with you know, additionally normalizing. So the question, uh, I guess, becomes, are you content with doing teacher forcing, um, which you know, has known problems of exposure bias, or uh, would you like to have a model um, that requires you to do a little bit of extra work during training, uh, but do, um, you know, doesn't necessarily have the issues of exposure bias? So we can contrast the perceptron and the globally normalized model that I talked about before. So a globally normalized probabilistic model uh, basically what it is doing is it is uh, calculating the log probability according to this value here. Um, we have the structured perceptron uh, where we take the maximum score and uh, do uh, this kind of max-based loss function. And we could also have another thing like the global structured perceptron where we basically sum over all of the values and, um, and calculate this loss here. And the, uh, so what you can see is basically two things have changed uh, from a globally normalized probabilistic model to the structured perceptron. The first thing that changed is uh, that we move from a probabilistic model to this uh, loss function here. And the second thing that changed is we're no longer summing over all of the hypotheses, but we're only summing over the highest scoring hypothesis and the, um, and the correct uh, output. And because of this, we could sum like this, but this would have the same computational problems as the globally normalized models, which is why we largely focus on only having one output here. So one thing to note, um, is I've been contrasting the structured training algorithms, uh, such as the structured perceptron to teacher forcing. And one issue is that um, neural networks have a lot of parameters and a big output space. And because of this, uh, training them is hard. And uh, because, so um, if we train with something like the structured perceptron, one issue with uh, this taking only one negative sample is that in contrast to a, a normal probabilistic model that's summing over many negative samples, um, we're essentially getting less training signal every time we do an update. And uh, because we're only penalizing one negative output. So uh, because of this, you know, training can be a little bit unstable or uh, slower. And um, Teacher forcing uh, efficiently updates all the parameters but suffers from exposure bias. So it's also quite common to pre-train with teacher forcing and then fine tune with some more complicated algorithm, especially for uh, things like translation or other things that have a very large output space. 
Um, this has its own problems, though, because what if you use uh, teacher forcing and kind of overfit the training data? There will be very little room for improvement uh, with your structured training algorithm after that. Uh, so you might want to train for fewer iterations with um, teacher forcing and then uh, continue training with your structured training algorithm or something like this. So um, it's not necessarily trivial to manage the trade-off between these two. Okay, so next I'd like to talk a little bit about um, a slightly more expressive variety of uh, algorithms similar to the percept uh, structured perceptron algorithm called hinge loss uh, based algorithms or margin based algorithms. And uh, one issue with the perceptron is that it basically uh, tries to update the model until you have no uh, mistaken classifications. And this is a simple binary classification problem in a continuous space. And you can see that both of the lines here, assuming they classify things on the right, upper right, as uh, circles and the lower left as X's would get 100% accu accuracy essentially. And so which one is better? And according to the perceptron algorithm, uh, both of them are fine because they make no mistakes. However, kind of intuitively, we can see the dashed line in the middle is better. So what a margin um, does is essentially it tries to penalize when an incorrect answer is within a particular margin of uh, being classified as correct. And so uh, the perceptron algorithm basically has a loss function that looks a little bit like this. Um, if you remember, we were subtracting the uh, score of the, um, of the correct answer from the incorrect answer and then taking a max of zero. So we have this kind of uh, shape like this. And what a hinge loss does is it essentially uh, makes it so that even if your correct answer it has a little bit higher score, you still get a penalty. So your correct answer has to be more than a, you know, like one better, for example. And in this particular graph, this margin M is one. So until the, uh, until the correct answer is at least one point more than the incorrect answer, uh, you would not get uh, accurate. Um, you would not get a full score. So this is, can be expressed in um, equations here. So this M over here uh, is the margin uh, and that kind of basically upweights your negative examples. Uh, by a certain amount so that the uh, positive example has to, uh, has to be greater than that amount. So hinge loss can be directly incorporated in any classifier that you would like to train, including with neural networks. So let's say we have a part of speech tagger. Uh, basically, instead of calculating your log loss according to the standard method in your toolkit, in Dynet this is called picneg log softmax, um, but you know you can make that for any other toolkit, um, you can just add a hinge loss. And the hinge loss will essentially uh, give you the graph similar to the one that I showed before. So if we're just talking about simple multi-class classification, um, trying this out is trivial. There is also a, um, a concept of cost augmented hinge losses, which I think is very attractive. And the reason why this is attractive is essentially this allows you to penalize some mistakes more than others. So I gave the motivating example earlier in this video about, uh, for example, if you make a mistake with a paraphrase in machine translation, then this is not very important. If I wanted to do this part of speech tagging example, maybe making a mistake between a noun and a plural noun is not very important, but making a mistake between a noun and a determiner would be a big problem. So what we do is we define a cost for each indirect decision and set the margin equal to this or multiplied by this. So we have this cost function 
between our two decisions, y hat and y, and uh, set the margin equal to uh, this, uh, this cost. Um, and just to give an example, uh, let's say making a mistake between a verb and a noun was bad, we set its cost to five. So the margin here would be five, which would mean the choice of noun would need to be, uh, sorry, the choice of verb would need to be five more than the choice of noun. But if we had a difference between a verb and a like present participle verb, um, maybe the cost would only be one. So the score of verb would have to be uh, one better than the score of present participle verb. So because we're talking about structured prediction, uh, what we're really interested in is not just individual multi-class decisions, but costs over sequences. So um, there's a number of different ways we could define a cost over a sequence. And the standard way that we're kind of thinking about when we're doing teacher forcing or something like this is we're treating the true sequence as uh, the, the correct answer and all the other ones as incorrect answers. So um, in this case, the zero one loss would be one if the sentences differ at all, but zero otherwise. But again, this doesn't take into uh, account the actual, you know, amount of difference between sequences. So if we get one part of speech tag wrong, that's probably a lot less bad than if we get 10 parts of speech tag, uh, parts of speech wrong. So uh, Hamming loss is a type of loss function that essentially um, takes this into account. So basically it gives one for every different element. Um, so if we look at each of the elements in a sequence, um, it gives a, uh, a loss of one. So th this uh, uh, delta function here basically is one whenever the condition is true. So if the um, identical part of speech tag is wrong, you get a penalty of one, otherwise you get a penalty of zero. And of course there's many other sequence-based losses. You could define any loss that you want uh, depending on your tasks. So one example could be edit distance or one minus blue score, uh, one minus BERT score if you want to use a more modern value, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And so we can also have a structured hinge loss. So the hinge loss is over a sequence with the largest margin violation. So what we do is we essentially take the argmax uh, value of the cost plus the score. And then this would be the value that we would want to penalize the model for. So we then, um, we then have a hinge loss over the sequence level loss plus the sequence level score minus the sequence level um, minus the sequence level score for the correct answer. However, this becomes a little bit complicated. Um, so, how do we find the argmax above? And uh, in some cases, where the loss can be calculated easily, we can cal consider the loss during search. Um, otherwise, you might need to output, you know, 10 or 20 high-scoring uh, hypotheses using Beam Search or something like this, and, uh, and then add the cost into them and do a sort of re-ranking based on the score and the cost. But I'll give the example of where we can decompose the, uh, the cost easily, specifically for the Hemming loss. So Hemming loss is decomposable over each word. So uh, what we do is we add the score, um, add a score equal to the cost to each incorrect decision during search. So let's say we have a, a part of speech tagger uh, that gives scores for each part of speech tag. And uh, we're using the Hemming loss, so everything but the correct part of speech tag essentially gets a, an increased value. Um, so what we can see is that normally this model um, would have gotten PRP correct. It would have given PRP a score of 1.3 and um, so our search algorithm would essentially have uh, picked 1.3. Um, but because we're adding the loss, uh, now the noun uh, part of speech gets a score of 1.5. And because of this, uh, the model will mistakenly uh, choose the noun class and pass this on.
to the next output. So this is an interesting algorithm, I think, because basically what it's doing is it's um, making it harder to get the correct answer. So you're making the model work extra hard during training time to get the correct answer. And because of this, um, it will be especially robust at test time uh, because you're making, of course, at test time, you don't even know the correct answer. So you couldn't uh, add these plus ones here. So the model will just um, you know, do, better, uh, do better at test time than it did at training time. Okay, so I talked about some margin-based structured prediction algorithms, um, which I think are, are very nice and uh, straightforward effective. Um, however, one issue with them is they're not based on uh, probabilistic models. Um, and uh, so there are issues with um, using them if we want an estimate of probability. So one way we can get around this um, is with an alternative formulation uh, called a reinforcement learning. And not all reinforcement learning models are probabilistic, but um, the most common method for training reinforcement learning models, specifically the policy gradient method, uh, does allow uh, probabilistic uh, decisions. And in the recommended reading, I have a tutorial by Karpathy uh, 2016 on reinforcement learning that's very nice. So uh, you can go through that as well if you'd like. So what is reinforcement learning? Um, Reinforcement learning is a learning problem where we have an environment X and ability to make actions A and we get a delayed reward R. And um, so there was an example in the tutorial uh, by Andre Karpathy on Pong where X is an observed image uh, of a Pong uh, game basically. A are actions uh, like up or down and R is the win or loss at the end of the game. Um, one other thing that I, I forgot to mention in the introduction to reinforcement learning is uh, that unlike uh, the structured prediction algorithms that I talked so far, you don't necessarily need a gold standard uh, action sequence, for example. So all of the ones I talked about before, I was talking about you know, the correct output. But in reinforcement learning, you don't necessarily need the correct output, you just need a reward. So it also broadens its applicability in addition to um, making it, uh, having the ability to make probabilistic decisions. So why would we want to use reinforcement learning in NLP? Um, one could be a typical reinforcement learning scenario where we don't have a gold standard action sequence. So an example of this might be a dialogue uh, where we're interacting with a user and we aren't necessarily given um, the correct answers to like what type of dialogue we should be doing. However, at the end of a conversation, um, we might see whether the user was satisfied or not by asking them or whether they buy uh, successfully buy a plane ticket using our plane ticket reservation system or something like this. And this is a scenario where we essentially, you know, should or basically have to use reinforcement learning because we don't know the gold standard sequences. Some other scenarios where reinforcement learning is used is when we have latent variables where uh, we have like a latent parse tree or a latent part of speech sequence or any other variety of latent uh, variable. And um, we decide the latent variable then get the reward based on the configuration of latent variables. And we also may have a sequence level error function such as blue score that we cannot optimize without first generating the whole sentence. So we can see that there's a number of scenarios where we could be using reinforcement learning. The first one we essentially have to, the second two we could choose RL or a margin based uh, function. So um, we have supervised MLE like I've talked about before. Um, we, we know all about this. We've seen it, uh, you know, a hundred times so far in this class. Um, but let me lay out the equations here just because they're a good contrast with what we would be doing in a reinforcement learning uh, based scenario or with, uh, with a policy gradient specifically. So um, we are given the correct decisions Y. And um, in the context of reinforcement learning, this is also called imitation learning because we're imitating a teacher. Um, 
although uh, the term imitation learning is more general and there's other, uh, other you know, imitation learning algorithms as well. But basically, in any imitation learning algorithm, we are given the, uh, the output and can learn from it. So next is self-training. In self-training, basically what we do is we sample or take the argmax according to the current model, like this. And then we use the sample or samples to maximize uh, the likelihood. So um, this is very similar to you know, regular maximum likelihood, except instead of using the correct answer, uh, we're using a model generated answer. So this is great in a way because now we no longer need the correct data. We could run this over you know, inputs in a different domain or something like this to generate more training data. Um, however, is it a good idea? And the answer may be, uh, may be no, because of course there may be mistakes in the uh, gener model generated outputs. So one uh, successful method for this is co-training, where uh, we only use sentences where multiple models agree with each other. Um, so this is essentially also uh, referred to as ensemble distillation, um, uh, which we talked about before, where we take multiple models and we, um, we combine their predictions together to generate uh, you know, training data or answers. And um, this is better than regular self-training because essentially if the models, if the ensemble is better than the self-trained model itself, then you can um, improve accuracy. Um, another uh, successful alternative uh, that was actually developed by Jun Chen here at CMU is to add noise to the input uh, to match the fact that there's noise in the output uh, during self-training. And this is surprisingly effective, very simple uh, fix, and I'd recommend looking at the paper if you're using self-training. So now moving on from self-training, uh, let's talk about policy gradient or reinforce algorithms. So these are very similar to self-training, but instead of um, just using the likelihood over the, self uh, the model generated output, we additionally add a term that scales the loss by the reward function. So this reward function essentially can be you know, any reward that we want, um, but because the reward is higher for better outputs, like let's say it's close to one for better outputs and close to zero for um, poor outputs, uh, it's not a condition, but let's say it is, that's the type of reward function we're dealing with. Um, Outputs that get a bigger reward will get a higher weight, will get upweighted. And if we think about under what conditions this is equal to, or essentially equivalent to maximum likelihood estimation, it's precisely when we have a zero one loss where we want to maximize the probability of the correct output um, when it's, uh, when we want to maximize the probability of the correct output and only the correct output. So you can see that uh, this policy gradient is kind of well motivated from that point of view. So um, very, very simple idea in general, um, but the issue with this is there's actually a lot of nuance that goes into making these uh, work. And um, the reason why is because of the same reason why the underlying perceptron algorithm is, is you know, problematic in some cases, which is that if we're sampling only a single output, um, and especially if we don't actually directly know or use the correct output here, um, this can lead to a lot of instability in the training algorithm. Uh, so I'll spend the next couple minutes uh, dis discussing how we can better stabilize these models. So uh, one way we can do so is um, by doing better credit assignment for rewards. So um, one issue with these models is if we only get a reward at the end of a very long sequence, we don't know which action um, led to a positive reward or negative reward. So just as an example, uh, let's say we're doing machine translation and we suddenly get a blue score of uh, 0.2 which is kind of mediocre, uh, 
that doesn't really give us very good information about which individual words in the output were translated well and which were translated poorly. So um, the best scenario is when we are able to get an immediate reward at each action we make. Uh, for example, each word we output or each part of speech we output. And um, so this is good because this can essentially improve our um, you know, prediction of what words are, are useful or what uh, actions were useful. And then the worst scenario is the one that I just talked about where we only get a reward at the very end. So um, a common strategy here is assigning decaying rewards for future events to take into account the time delay between the action and the reward. Um, so what this is saying is the previous actions might have led up to the reward that we just got, um, but the actions that are further in the past are less likely to have an effect, which is often true. Okay, next I'm going to go a little bit into uh, stabilizing reinforcement learning uh, in more detail. And so, as I mentioned before, there's some problems with reinforcement learning. Um, like other sampling-based methods, it can be unstable, um, and particularly so when using bigger output spaces, such as all the words in a vocabulary. And uh, I'll be going through some strategies to stabilize. So the first one is uh, adding a baseline. And the basic idea is that we have expectations about a reward for a particular you know, input a priori. So like, let's say we wanted to do translation of uh, this is an easy sentence and uh, another sentence that the model has not seen before, like buffalo, 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 which uh, actually, believe it or not, is a grammatical English sentence. And if you don't believe me, please Google it and you'll find a Wikipedia page about it. Um, and so we get a reward of 0 0.8 for uh, translating the easy sentence and 0.3 for translating the uh, harder sentence. However, a priori, we maybe expected that we would do very well on the first sentence and very poorly on the second sentence. So our model actually underperformed expectations on the first and overperformed expectations on the second. <coughs> Excuse me. So basically, um, what this means is uh, we can quantify this by taking the reward uh, minus the baseline. Um, so the uh, value for the first one is minus uh, 0 0.15 and the, the value for the second one is 0 0.2. Um, so we get a positive value here. And um, this, uh, by weighting our likelihood by this, uh, this reflects when we did better or worse than expected. Here's the equation. So the basic idea here is that this um, can stabilize our uh, reward, uh, reduce variance, and um, overall speed up training. So this is really essential and should be used in any uh, you know, reinforcement learning implementation. Um, one thing is you shouldn't back prop through the baseline, uh, so make sure you stop gradients before you, uh, before you calculate this. So there's a number of ways we can calculate this baseline, which, as you'll remember, should be our a priori belief that a particular uh, value is uh, good, uh, or a particular sentence uh, will get a particular uh, reward. And the choice of this baseline is basically arbitrary, uh, as long as it um, uh, allows us to stabilize the reward. So one option is that we can predict uh, the final reward using a linear transform from the current state. So basically, we train a predictive model for a reward. Um, we can do this on the sentence level, where we have one baseline per sentence, or on the decoder state level, uh, where we have one baseline per output action, for example. Another option is to use the mean of the rewards in the batch as the baseline. Um, and the basically what this says is if we um, have multiple inputs in a batch, or maybe even multiple outputs uh, in a batch, then this allows us uh, multiple outputs for the same input in a batch. This allows us to kind of normalize over the current level of performance for the model. So this is uh, a pretty widely used technique as well. 
Another thing is increasing the batch size. So um, one of the issues with uh, reinforcement learning is that each sample uh, results in a relatively high variance in the uh, gradients that we get. And so what we can do is we can sample many different examples before performing an update. So this is simple enough. Um, we can also create the number of examples um, done for a particular input. So we can, you know, try 10 different action sequences for a particular input instead of just one. And this also helps quite a bit. There's also a concept of experience replay, which basically um, one of the issues with reinforcement learning is especially when we, when calculating new uh, action sequences is relatively expensive compared to uh, scoring existing action sequences. So let's say we're using a very large beam search or uh, something like this in calculating uh, our outputs. Um, if that's the case, then just, what we can do is we can just save previous inputs and the corresponding action sequences and uh, reuse them when we update parameters. So another thing that I've already talked about is warm start. So basically start with maximum likelihood, then switch over to reinforce. Um, however, uh, in the reinforcement learning scenario, uh, this, uh, it's worth commenting that this works in the uh, scenarios where we can run MLE in the first place. So this would not necessarily work in scenarios where we're calculating latent variables or in standard RL settings where we don't have a gold standard action sequence. Um, another possibility is instead of first training with maximum likelihood, we can then gradually transition from MLE to the full objective. So I've talked a whole lot about uh, various kind of well thought out um, you know, methods for handling exposure bias or uh, reward mismatch. Um, but there's also a couple of similar remedies that are worth mentioning at the very end. So these are not, you know, maybe as principled as some of the other remedies that I talked about here, but nonetheless, um, they're worth knowing because they're very easy to implement. So um, what's wrong with, you know, structured prediction? Um, uh, I wrote structured hinge loss here, but it could be structured prediction algorithms in general. So they consider fewer hypotheses, so they're unstable. Uh, they require generating outputs during training so they can be slow um, and generally must resort to pre-training. Um, and even then, it's not as stable as a teacher forcing with a maximum likelihood. So some alternative methods are uh, sampling mistakes during training. Um, so this is a method uh, called DAGGER. Um, it's also known as scheduled sampling in the, uh, in the neural network uh, land. And so basically what we do is we randomly sample wrong decisions and feed them in uh, to our decoder. And so uh, we calculate scores, we calculate our probabilities over the correct uh, output for the loss function. But then when we decide which thing to feed in to the next decoder state, we might be sampling uh, directly from the probability distribution. So the reason why this is good is this can make uh, essentially um, uh, add some noise in, and uh, cause the decoder to be more robust to noise at test time. Um, so uh, then there becomes a question about how to choose the best next tag that we should be annotating um, or that we should be calculating the loss with respect to. And um, there's a number of ways to do this. Um, we can either use the gold standard tag directly or we could uh, do something like create a, a dynamic oracle that chooses the tag that will result in the best uh, scoring output if we choose that tag next. So to give an example, if we're doing something like parsing, um, uh, shift reduced parsing, which we talked about in the lec last lecture, um, if we shift instead of uh, reducing, that might move a word off of the buffer or the queue into the input. And then if the next gold standard action was also shift, that might no longer be a legal action uh, when we want to go and, uh, and predict the next output. So because of that, 
um, we might instead just pick, from the legal actions pick the best action that could result in the highest score. So if you're interested in this, you can refer back to the uh, paper here for more details. Another very simple solution is dropping out inputs. So we simply don't input the previous decision sometimes during training. So you know if we have something like this, we just feed in a zero vector instead of the previous input. So it's kind of a simpler version of scheduled sampling um, or dagger. The advantage of this is that we don't actually need to make any predictions. We can just randomly zero things out. So it's uh, very efficient, very easy to apply. Another thing that we can do is corrupt the training data. So there's a method called reward augmented maximum likelihood. And the idea is basically we randomly sample incorrect training data and then train with maximum likelihood. So uh, we will sample uh, random perturbations of the output and then do maximum likelihood here. And the important thing is uh, we don't do it completely randomly uh, because otherwise there would be no you know, training signal. But rather uh, we do it according to um, the, pro it's proportional to the goodness of the output. So we're much more likely to sample um, high scoring outputs than we are to sample low scoring outputs. And this can be shown to approximately minimize risk. So the, uh, this is all we have for today. Um, I'm going to uh, talk a little bit of, in the discussion, I'd like people to uh, discuss uh, potential application scenarios for this and the uh, situations that you're interested in, uh, structured prediction problems you're interested in, be it dialogue or parsing or machine translation. And when we talk about this, uh, what are some of the issues that you might be considering uh, or running into and what would be some of the evaluation measures you would want to um, use and what optimization algorithms do you think would be most appropriate for your situation. So that is all for today. Uh, thank you very much.